Greetings, everyone. I am Aishan Hutchinson, the director of the Creative Writing Program here at Cornell. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the final event in the Spring 2021 Barbara and David Zalaznik Reading Series together. This series is made possible thanks to the generosity of our donors, Barbara and David Zalaznik, to whom we extend our bountiful thanks. This evening's event features a reading by the marvelous poet and memoirist Carolyn Forche, who will be introduced by my colleague, Volgina Mort. After the reading, Professor Mort will moderate a conversation with Carolyn Forche, for which I am super excited. You can participate in this conversation by submitting questions in the chat throughout the event. A reminder that this event is being recorded, and the recording will be available to view at the same URL after the event. But before I turn over to Professor Moore to kick things off, I wish to say a word of thanks to, to her and my other brilliant colleagues in the creative, creative writing program, Larry Van Cleef Stefanen, J. Robert Lennon, Stephanie Vaughan, Nafisa Thompson Spires, Robert Morgan, Emily Friedland, Michael Cook, Joni Makowski, and Helen Vermontis. Thank you for making the presence of literature so resonant at Cornell and for all the work you have done in this reading series. Very special thanks to our superb events coordinator and events assistant, Lynn Lopper and Aurora Ricardo. Lynn and Aurora are essentially magicians of the highest order. My deepest bow of gratitude to Chris Warford and his staff at eCornell. They have made the virtual space adventure a million times easier to navigate and I'm very grateful for them. Again, thanks to our donors, Barbara and David Zalaznik. Um, if it weren't for them, this series wouldn't be possible in the first place. Their continual support is a beacon of light for us all. I hope you take care of yourselves and see you one way or another in the fall. Now, over to you, Valjana. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody, and thank you, Aishan. It is deeply moving to introduce one of the most important, most ambitious, and most unsettling American poets who lives in complete alignment with her work, writing and speaking from one awakened heart to the whole world, Carolyn Forche. Carolyn Forche was born in 1950 in a working class religious Catholic family, the oldest of seven children. They lived in a suburb of Detroit. Her dad was a tool and die maker. Her mother, after two years of college education, held on to a textbook on poetic form that she passed to her daughter. In 1976, gathering the tribes, for Shea's first book of poetry was selected for the Yale series of younger poets by Stanley Kunitz. Next year, through a friend, for Shea came to spend a summer in Mallorca, translating a poet, Claribel Alegria, a Salvadorian poet who lived there in political exile. This translation project and here I wink at my translation students, this translation project launched for Shea into a life so unparalleled, so ecstatic in its ancient meaning of standing outside of oneself, that it could rival any work of fiction. Back in San Diego, where she was teaching, Carolyn was visited by Allegria's nephew, a mysterious figure called Lionel Gomez Vides, who invited her to join him in El Salvador to bear witness as a poet to what was happening there, a civil war about to break out. Caroline Forche's masterpiece, The Country Between Us, bears witness to what she saw in El Salvador just as much as it reveals the broader U.S.-backed oppression in Latin America. This best-selling poetry book was published the year of my birth, which means that it has withstood the test 
of 40 years of its existence in the literary world that would have much preferred that a young poet stayed in the myopic American domesticity, often confused with interiority. For years, Caroline Forche kept working on her memoir about her stay in El Salvador. In the meantime, three astonishing poetry books came out, three attempts to find language equal to what the poet has seen, sensed, and learned. The Angel of History came out in 1994, Blue Hour in 2004, and most recently in 2020, In the Lateness of the World. Carolyn Forche is also the editor of two essential anthologies, Against Forgetting, 20th Century Poetry of Witness, and Poetry of Witness, The Tradition in English. At the heart of everything she does is history. What is history? History is what hurts. Caroline Forche looks at despair with an eye disciplined by poetry to the highest state of lucidity. She does not invite us to imagine the unimaginable. Rather, her poetry is a testament to the banality of the unimaginable, to the aggression of the rational, to the thinness of terror. Over and over again, Forche asks herself and of herself, what can a human do with what she sees? To read Caroline Forche is to receive an education in seeing and doing. Her memoir about the time in El Salvador is not just a book. It is an education, a degree in unmatched living. It is titled after her famous poem, What You Have Heard Is True. It came out in 2020 and was shortlisted for the National Book Award. I have avoided listing Carolyn's many honors because to my mind, her work is beyond the scope of any literary award. There are many outstanding awards she has received in recognition of her work. But what are these many awards next to a morning when a poet receives an unsolicited fax from Nelson Mandela, who, having read the manuscript of Against Forgetting, praises her for cultivating a flower in a graveyard. Upon honoring Carolyn Forche with 2013 Academy of American Poets Fellowship, Chancellor Juan Felipe Herrera recited the following dedication that echoes um, this image of cultivation. For her steady gaze into the abyss and for her crafted house of awakened human heavens where she calls us to live, we celebrate and recognize Carolyn Forche and her heroic career, gathering word by word embers to face and save lives before they disappeared. Carolyn Forche, we are honored to welcome you at Cornell. Thank you, Valgina. It's a beautiful introduction, and thank you everyone at Cornell, Aishan, and everyone for this welcome and for your hospitality. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. I'll begin with an invocation poem. Museum of Stones. These are your stones, assembled in matchbox and tin, collected from roadside, culvert and viaduct, battlefield, threshing floor, basilica, Abattoir, stones loosened by tanks in the streets from a city whose earliest map was drawn in ink on linen, schoolyard stones in the hand of a corpse, pebble from Baudelaire's we, stone of the mind within us, carried from one silence to another, 
Stone of Cromlech and Cairn, schist and shale, hornblend, agate, marble. Millstones, ruins of choirs and shipyards, chalk, marl, mudstone from temples and tombs. Stone from the silvery grass near the scaffold. Stone from the tunnel lined with bones. Lava of a city's entombment. Stones chipped from lighthouse, cell wall, scriptorium. Paving stones from the hands of those who rose against the army. Stones where the bells had fallen, where the bridges were blown. Those that had flown through windows, weighted petitions, feldspar, rose quartz, blue schist, niece and chart. Fragments of an abbey at dusk. Sandstone toe of a Buddha, mortared at Bamiyan. Stone from the hill of three crosses and a crypt. From a chimney where storks cried like human children. Stones newly fallen from stars. A stillness of stones. A heart. Altar and boundary stone. Marker and vessel, first cast, load and hail. Bridge stones and others to pave and shut up with. Stone apples, stone basil, beech berry, stone break. Concretion of the body, as blind, as cold, as deaf. All earth a quarry, all life a labor. Stone-faced, stone drunk with hope that this assemblage of rubble taken together would become a shrine or holy place, an ossuary, immovable and sacred, like the stone that marked the path of the sun as it entered the human dawn. One day I'm home alone in Southern California. The doorbell rang. I wasn't expecting anyone and there was a strange vehicle in my driveway. I looked outside and there were El Salvador license plates. Answering that door changed everything about my life for the rest of my life. I wasn't capable of writing it 30 years ago when I first came back from El Salvador. Partly because the experience was very fresh I had not processed it. I had no perspective on it. I waited until 2003, and that's when I began. And it took me 15 years to write it. It was the most difficult work I had ever done. And finally, I found the book. I found my way in. It was like moving through a tunnel of the past and memory and experience. Leonel Gomez Vidas, who brought me to El Salvador, I used to think he was a genius and he was bulletproof and nothing would happen to me as long as I was with him. And the repartee between my young self and him is something I really wanted to capture. His obsessions and his theories, his way of playing what seemed like 12 dimensional chess against the world, against evil, really. It was a time just before the war. It was a country at peace, which he defined as a state of, of silence in which misery is still endured and nothing has happened to counteract it. What he wanted to do was to try to find some way out of the war that he knew was coming. I wanted to bring the reader along with me on the journey that I took and feel what I was feeling as things happened. I don't leave the dream and and awaken the reader to the fact that I'm in the present, alive and telling the story. What was important was to show what happened during that journey that bequeathed to me an education that allowed me to see the world, to see the world differently. It is near the end now. 
We are walking in the rippling heat of a sorghum field, cicadas whirring to an empty sky. A man uncorks a water gourd. Another man leans against a spade. There is a woman here, too, wearing an apron skirt over her trousers. Hard light and the dry rattle of sorghum seed heads. I'm holding a spray of seeds. One of the men takes Leonel aside and tells him something. A secret, like everything else. We get into the jeep and, without explanation, drive to another place not far from this field. The campesinos, rural peasants, would have walked, measuring distance not in kilometers, but in hours or days. What are we looking for, I ask, and as always, he doesn't answer, swearing under his breath under the haze, through the haze of smoke that hangs in the air where the corn had been growing. We stop near a cluster of champas, shacks made of mud and wattle. One of them has collapsed and smoke rises from it. Wait here, he tells me, but I don't wait. I had stopped waiting for him in the jeep months before this, but he can't seem to break this habit of telling me to wait. Smoke is rolling like a shore cloud along the fields just above the blackened stubble. We walk, and when he stops, I stop, and when he continues, I continue. He palms the air to say, slow down, or be quiet. I slow down and am quiet. When we reach the champas, no one is in them. No one is home. A large plastic bowl used for making the slurry that becomes tortilla dough is overturned on the ground. There is a child's T-shirt in the tortilla slurry. Behind one of the champas, it appears that several hens have been held by their feet and whacked against a stone. They were lying on the ground, one of them still opening and closing its beak. A hundred or so meters more and we hear the whine of flies, the hissing and belching of turkey vultures, a flapping of wings like applause in the maize stalks as the fattened birds try to lift themselves. A flatbed truck follows at a distance behind us, with three campesinos standing in the back. They are calling out to us or to the driver of the truck, but I don't understand what they say. I don't know what I had expected to see, but not the swollen torso of a man with one arm attached to him, a black pool of tar over his crotch. I didn't expect that his head would be by itself some distance away without eyes or lips. The stench in the air is familiar, a rotting, sweet, sickening smell, human death. I bend down when I see the head, but I hear Lionel saying, don't touch it, let the others do it. At first, I thought they were going to find the rest of the man and place his remains in the truck, but instead, They gather the arms and hands, the legs with their feet attached, and bring them to the torso where it lies on the ground. They set the head on the neck where it once had been. Then the three men take off their straw hats and stand in a circle around the man they have reassembled. They stand and one of them crosses himself lightly. The parts are not quite touching. There is soil between them, especially the head and the rest, no eyes or lips, or tongue, birds hissing nearby, hoping we will go away and leave them to this meal. The air hums, we walk. Why doesn't anyone do something, I think I asked. Dr. Vicky sent me with Anna through the wards. The young campesino who had no medical training, but whose heart was good. The girl hired to swish the flies with a newspaper from the newborn's head as it crowns, to give sits baths as I had learned to do at her age, to diaper the baby, swab the sores, strip and refresh the sheets. We moved together from bed to bed, and she combed the patient's hair while I took pulses and temperatures, startled at how bright and yet blank the patient's eyes were, how the light fell on their bony faces, these nearly skeletal workers from the campo who lived on daily tortillas with a lump of beans and drank boiled sorghum instead of coffee. 
One woman's feet had swollen to twice their size, but the rest of her body seemed made of bones and cloth. A man had suffered a machete wound that had not been closed in time, and the burning gash across his thigh had become infected. Another woman had lain so long on her cot that bed sores had opened on her buttocks, such as I remembered from the convalescent home. There, we would pull the dead flesh away with a large tweezers, then pour a little peroxide over the wound until the bubbling stopped. Here, there was another method. The woman was lying on her stomach, legs sp splayed awkwardly under her gown, clutching the bars of the headboard with her fists. When Anna lifted the gown, I saw that maggots were feeding on the sore, rising up, falling back so that the wound itself appeared to be alive. Anna took a teaspoon from her apron pocket and handed it to me. We can take them out now, she whispered. They are finished. Isalco, he said. Remember the volcano that erupted on the night of the uprising in 32? That volcano is sleeping now. But the fire in the earth is close to the surface here, Papu. All through this area, there are geysers, fumaroles, and small volcanoes, some with lakes in their craters, some sleeping, some pretending to sleep. Over there is a paneca, a classic volcano such as children might draw with a little puff of smoke coming out of the top. They used to bring the coffee harvest through this forest by mule train to the port of Acajutla, and they had to pass through the Hacienda Imposible and then across the gorge. They built rickety makeshift bridges across this gorge that sometimes didn't hold. Mules, sacks of coffee, men and boys all dropped into the gorge to their deaths when these bridges gave way. That is how the gorge came to be called El Imposible. The people would then build another bridge and the same thing would happen. Some of them held for a time, of course, which made matters worse because this made people think there was a chance. I tried to imagine a wooden bridge letting go of a gorge wall and tipping the mule carts, mules running in the air wild-eyed, straw hats falling just above the men's heads, coffee sacks breaking open and beans ticking into the sharp rocks at the bottom and forming hills of coffee. The government built a solid bridge in 1968 and announced that El Imposible was now possible. I don't know about that, but it's getting dark. By then, no one wanted to be on the roads at night. Lionel opened a trunk in the back and retrieved a Magnum 357 and its clip. He leaned into the jeep, slid the clip into the weapon, and laid it beside the 9mm Smith & Wesson. Night fell to the volcanic peaks and spilled into the valleys like ink. I've never seen anything like this, I whispered, even in the desert, even in Deya. I was closer here to the equator than I had ever been, on a night gauzed with starlight. Lionel, can we just stay here for a little while? I've just never seen... I know, but the answer is no. Maybe I can show you the stars another time, in a place just as dark, but safer than this. Let's go. Later, I would find something written in pencil in my notebook. Walking in the field, in the campo, the light, the day, sky, wind, a man drinking from a dried and hollowed gourd, another leaning on a hoe, a woman with an apron skirt over her trousers, the light, the rattle of sorghum and its flower, the spray of seeds resembling barley, and then we come upon something that begins with flies, the soft drone of a squadron of flies, as if the field were humming to itself. In the same notebook, I found this, also written in pencil. People from the countryside are coming into the city. Some live between road and fence with no place to relieve themselves. Houses made from shipping crates stamped this side up, stamped Maytag, harvest gold. Roofs weighted with rubber tires, walls lighted by coals, set on fire in lard cans, punched with holes. The light dances on walls and coals give off sparks like the salt of stars in the fields. Cane smoke blackens the air, coffee ripens in the high slope. 
slopes, red coffee cherries in white mist. It is the time of bloody stool in the ditch, of maggots in wounds, of flies in the clinic. Bodies found by the roadside are covered with lime. No one wants to eat the fish from Lake Kilopango anymore. The fish have been eating the dead. And that is where it ends. Words strung together into notes that are not a poem. I don't remember when I began writing this way in pencil or why, other than pencil that is faint on the paper. So the words evanesce, waiting to be erased. However, rather than using the eraser, I usually cross out unwanted words and phrases. Whole sentences crossed out. In the notebooks from El Salvador, entire pages are struck through or left blank, not only at the end of the book, but within, as if I couldn't continue without turning to a new page. I wrote down in pencil what I saw, what I heard, and was careful not to use people's real names. There are no addresses or telephone numbers, and my birth name is nowhere to be found inside. Any lost notebooks remained lost. The others are here with me. I have heard it said that to write is to dream on paper. In these notebooks from the time of El Salvador, there are no dreams. Sixth excerpt. This is how I first saw Monsignor Oscar Romero from a distance over the heads of the congregation in an unfinished cathedral in his white vestments before a spray of microphones, giving a homily ending with a litany of the names of those disappeared or found dead that week, some of whom were in coffins lined up at the altar with windows cut into the lids to reveal their faces, except the mutilated. In shafts of sunlit dust sent from the louvers of the two bell towers, we stood shoulder to shoulder, women in scarves or mantillas, men holding their straw hats, children sitting along the altar rail as the homily was broadcast to thousands of radios throughout the country, to machine shops, bodegas, to pickup trucks and battery operated radios in the villages. When his homily giving guidance and counsel came to an end, Monsignor walked toward the coffins with an aspergillum, sprinkling holy water on the wooden boxes. And then he walked through the congregation and we parted to make a path for him. The water sprinkling down on our bowed heads as it had on the coffins. Later, I would understand that here the dead and the living were together and those who stood alive before him, he was blessing in advance. During the next days, we drove through the Western Highlands, climbing the slopes into the clouds from Chiche to Santa Cruz del Quiche, then north near Neva, where we spent a cold night in an adobe house offered by another man, Lionel Nu, who also gave us ears of roasted corn and tortillas wrapped in cloth, which we ate by candlelight. When the flame died out, he told me to get some sleep. I lay down on a pile of rugs with his field jacket over me, and heard him cross the floor, and then the door closed behind him. He was not going to the hammock slung on the other side of the darkness. He was leaving me alone. It was as I imagined the grave would be, with the coffin closed and the earth shoveled onto its lid, an absolute dark with no escapes, shovel after shovel, until there is no sound, the ear cupped so as to hear nothing, the lid inches from the face, a darkness like boiling tar or an unfinished tunnel. The Mayans don't distinguish between past, present, and future, he'd said. They have one word to describe all instances of time, meaning something like, it came to pass. If you know the past, you know the cyclic forces that created the present. And by knowing the cyclic influences exerting themselves on the present, you can foresee the future. And this, he said, is why the present interests me so much. If you can learn to read the present without preconceptions, you will better know which of all possible futures will come to pass. There is nothing magical about this. It is a skill that can be acquired by anyone. 
with the inclination and discipline. In the morning, I found him loading several bundles of what appeared to be Mayan weavings into the remaining space at the back of the hiachi because something was going to happen here soon, he said. And the women want for us to take these things to safety and bring them back someday when and if the time comes. When, what time comes? What is going to happen? I don't know. They say they will be forced to leave and they won't be able to carry anything with them. And it could be even worse than that. What do they think? I'm not sure. This place has been tense for a long time, but this is something new. As we drove away from Neva, a group of women and girls watched us from the middle of the road, clustered together but not waving to us as they grew distant in the mirror. What's in the bundles? Headscarves, slings for tying children to their backs, belts such as you were given, and something that surprised me. We had gone around a curve in the road and the women had disappeared. Something that told me how serious the moment is, we may not be able to come back for a long time. In Santa Cruz del Quiche, I asked him again, what else is in the bundles? Their wedding weepiles. It takes months to weave one. A weaver might have a thousand patterns committed to memory, and each of these wipiles is one among a thousand. Those women want us to keep the wipiles safe. And what? And you are going to do this, Babu, because soon nothing will be safe with me. I'll return to poems now. The Boatman. This is about it a refugee uh, from Homs in Syria. We were 31 souls, he said, in the gray sick of sea, in a cold rubber boat, rising and falling in our filth. By morning, this didn't matter. No land was in sight. All were soaked to the bone, living and dead. We could still float, we said, from war to war, What lay behind us but ruins of stone, piled on ruins of stone? City called mother of the poor, surrounded by fields of cotton and millet. City of jewelers and cloak makers with the oldest church in Christendom and the sword of Allah. If anyone remains there now, he assures they would be utterly alone. There is a hotel named for it in Rome, 200 meters from the Piazza di Spagna, where you can have breakfast under the portraits of film stars. There the staff cannot do enough for you. But I am talking nonsense again, as I have since that night we fetched a child, not ours, from the sea, drifting face down in a life vest, its eyes taken by fish or the birds above us. After that, Aleppo went up in smoke, and Raqqa came under a rain of leaflets warning everyone to go. Leave, yes, but go where? We lived through the Americans and Russians, through Americans again, many nights of death from the clouds, morning surprised to be waking from the sleep of death, still unburied and alive with no safe place. Leave, yes, we'll obey the leaflets, but go where? To the sea, to be eaten, to the shores of Europe, to be caged, to camp misery and camp remain here. I ask you then, where? You tell me you are a poet. If so, our destination is the same. I find myself now the boatman driving a taxi at the end of the world. I will see that you arrive safely, my friend. I will get you there. The Light Keeper. A night without ships. Foghorns calling into walled cloud and you still alive. Drawn to the light as if it were a fire kept by monks. Darkness once crusted with stars, but now death dark as you sail inward. 
Through wild gorse and sea rack, through heather and torn wool you ran, pulling me by the hand so I might see this for once in my life. The spin and spin of light, the whirring of it, light in search of the lost, there since the era of fire, era of candles and hollow wick lamps, whale oil and solid wick, colza and lard, kerosene and carbide, the signal fires lighted on this perilous coast in the Tower of Hook. You say to me, stay awake. Be like the lens maker who died with his lungs full of glass. Be the you in blossom when bees swarm. Be their amber cathedral, and even the ghosts of Cistercians will be kind to you. In a certain light, as after rain, in pearled clouds or the water beyond, seen or sensed water, sea or lake, you would stop still and gaze out for a long time. Also when fireflies opened and closed in the pines and a star appeared, our only heaven you taught me to live like this, that after death it would be as it was before we were born. Nothing to be afraid, nothing but happiness as unbearable as the dread from which it comes. Go toward the light always. Be without ships. Morning on the Island. The lights across the water are the waking city. The water shimmers with imaginary fish. Not far from here lie the bones of conifers washed from the sea and piled by wind. Some mornings I walk upon them bone to bone as far as the lighthouse. A strange beetle has eaten most of the trees. It may have come here on the ships playing music in the harbor or it was always here. A winged jewel, but in the past was kept still by the cold of a winter that no longer comes. There is an owl living in the firs behind us, but he is white, meant to be mistaken for snow, burdening a bough. They say he is the only owl remaining. I hear him at night, listening for the last of the mice and asking who of no other owl. I would like to um, close with a reading a piece that it, this is for Valgina and um, it's a little piece about going, it's from a new book I'm working on. It's a prose, I think it's a prose book and I'm not sure what exactly more it is. Uh, but I visited Belarus, a country contaminated by the Chernobyl disaster, the country that Valgina was born in the year my book was published. Here's a passage from that journey. It opens with my desire to visit the offices of Helsinki Watch in Minsk. There would be someone there, I thought. There was always someone there working all day and late into the night, a woman usually with short cropped hair, a thin woman who chain smoked and ate street food at her desk out of paper bags. She had a messy desk, but could usually find what she wanted. She had an antique computer, a Rolodex with many blank cards, blank because she kept things in her head. After work late, she walked home at night worrying at times that her footsteps were too loud on the pavement and sensing briefly that someone was walking behind her and her husband would be there in the apartment, asleep and occasionally angry, not very angry, not so he would say he had had enough, but irritated that once more she had worked late and come home by herself. In the morning, she would kiss him awake, grab her bag, and run down the stairs, hoping to squeeze herself into the crowded bus and go back to the office to get there before something happened, as something always happened. 
And she would send emails about this something or try to make international phone calls about this something. Or she would call someone who would call someone about this something. She worked without resources and was a nuisance to tyrants. She worked in every country I had ever been in, or rather, she worked in the sorts of countries I went to. And I wanted to meet her here, now, in Minsk. I had come to Belarus, I thought, for two reasons. To investigate human rights abuses perpetrated by Lukashenko's government, but also because I'd heard reports of people moving into the so-called alienation zones surrounding the damaged Chernobyl reactor. Not only the elderly who had always lived there and had found a way secretly to avoid evacuation or had stolen back in the aftermath, but others who had gone in to farm on lands that had been condemned for thousands of years. What did I want to do? I wanted to go to these zones of alienation or exclusion or as near to them as I could get. But why, Ilya would have asked me, and I should also have asked myself, to see what? To do what? To stand in a condemned field of high grass and wildflowers, such as the field in which I hid as a child, the field in which I dug a pit large enough for myself with a roof of cut grasses heaped over scrap lumber, a field like that, but poisoned for millennia. To hear for myself that there were no birds. To see, even from a distance, the abandoned city of Pripyat, the ghost city. But as it happened, the zones began quite far from Minsk, several hours drive south on the highway that grew emptier and, em and quieter as we drove. But unlike Ukraine, the Belarus side was unpatrolled. And refugees, they said, they live here too. What refugees? People from Tajikistan, Moldova, and Armenia. Also some Chechens from the war in Chechnya, they come. They say they would rather live in a hot zone than be killed in a hot spot. You know this expression, hot spot. Whatever places journalists seem most interested to go. As I understood these men, Chechen refugees would rather live in the zone or die there if it was in fact true that someone can die from something invisible. My companions knew a route we could travel, particularly with diplomatic plates, and they knew what to show me. But there wasn't time to go all the way. And furthermore, we didn't have dosimeters with us to measure radiation. And if I wished to meet with illegal residents of the zones, more advanced planning would have been appreciated. You know, though, other Westerners have come. The Swedes, the Canadians, international teams. They arrive, they measure, they study, and they go. We never get to see any of their results. But if you're going to write, then of course we'll take you. Again, if you're going to write, or this, when you return to the United States, please write. Not to us, as one would suppose in bidding farewell, but about us. In the refugee camps of South Lebanon, in the Bantustans of apartheid South Africa, during those long nights of insomnia, during the height of the death squad terrors in El Salvador, always the same faith in the written word, the same urgency as was expressed in Vyslava Zimborska's hunger camp at Jasko. Write it. Write. In ordinary ink. On ordinary paper. If you're going to write, we'll take you. That's it. The door opens. But beyond that door opens the mystery of what is always being hidden from us. Censored miseries, so-called collateral damages, the policeman's hand over the camera lens, the blacked out phrases in declassified documents, whatever it is they don't want you to know. This is what must be opened to the air. This is what must be written. Thank you. Hi, Valjina. Thank you so much, Carolyn. I think that there is no Zoom anymore. There's no virtual reality anymore. There's only Carolyn for share reality <laughs> right now. Only the reality of your poetry and prose. 
Thank you so much for that gift, that personal gift of a piece on Belarus. Um, it's uh, very timely because um, the 35th anniversary of the Chernobyl disaster is this week, yet uh, mm -hmm. five days ago, um, uh, or, or three, three days ago, April 26th. Um, and um, uh, listening to you uh, made me uh, dream about an event where you and Svetlana Alexievich are together in conversation. Um, oh. And... <laughs> Um, um, I know that you read together in Tbilisi, Georgia, we right? Did, yes, we yeah. did. It was beautiful to meet her. It was just before she won the Nobel Prize. And we were just women hanging out together because the men were all hanging out with each other. <laughs> and then a week later, she won the Nobel Prize. It was incredible, really. Mm. Well, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> uh, I hope I hope one day we'll, we can do that reading, perhaps even in Minsk, uh, but also at Cornell. I would like to thank you again for this um, powerful reading, and I would like to invite every listener and reader um, who has a question to send it to us. Um, I'm going to share it with Carolyn. Uh, and um, while you are doing that, I'm going to jump in with my own. Um, I, uh, you know, we spent this last year confined, dangerously confined or feeling in danger. And, um, but I was reading uh, your memoir, What You Have Heard Is True, in which you constantly travel every morning and night. You go out, but also very dangerously. Um, and um, so, um, and Lionel invited you to come to El Salvador, he said, because you were a poet, perhaps you have an explanation why he wanted a poet in particular. Um, and it's true that we see he was really facited in that uh, you did write a masterpiece, you did write a poetic response, um, so powerful, so legendary. Um, um, and um, I want to ask you a question about the relationship between the poetry book, um, the, uh, the country between us that he, Lionel, asked you to write, and the book that you wrote yourself. And uh, we know from even here in the excerpts, you've been writing it throughout because you kept the notebooks, the memoir. What what is the relationship between them? Are they in an argument? Uh, are they is one of them in the shadow of another, or are they in the light of each other? I would say that the obvious connection, just from listening to you read, is that you have um, a really unique uh, talent for listening, uh, and people open up to you. People tell you their stories. People want you to hear their stories. Uh, but also, as a poet, you have a remarkable musical ear. So you're also listening to something that is beyond information and beyond just a story. And that is heard, can be heard very clearly in the prose as in the poetry. So what is the relationship between these two books and prose and poetry for you? Between the country between us and what you have heard is true. Um, I had been... I had promised Lionel that I would write about this, and I'd also promised this to Monsignor Romero, and uh, and I somehow felt that the poems were written very immediately near to the events, and and somehow I I knew that so much more had happened than was in the poems, and principally what what did they mean by this? I thought perhaps they meant the whole pain of what was happening in the country and to the people. And I I needed something more capacious. I needed a fuller place to tell the story. But I waited for many years to write it because I, I realize now that whatever excuses I gave for myself not to write it, I was afraid because I knew that um, in writing it, I would live through it again. And I don't think I wanted to live through some of it again. But I kept hearing the voices and saying to me, please write about this someday. And I knew they meant all of those events. And so 
uh, what is the difference between poetry and prose. Poetry is very, is, is deep, deep and musical and compressed and condensed and, and it doesn't, um, it does what it wants. It comes when it comes and um, it comes from someplace very deep in the human soul, I believe. And what I needed was a, a form, the prose form, so that I could, so that I could relay the story with the details and tell something that I that um, I didn't think would arrive in the poem. I think the poems are a little; they are almost like little, very, very tightly compressed pieces of this book. They're like little hand grenades that can detonate inside that book, the prose book. And for me, it was really necessary to write in, and now I know why. Because when it was published, I suddenly felt that a, something had lifted off of me, like with great, with great wings, a big weight had gone from me. The, the experiences were no longer being carried around inside I was free and they were there in the world to um, to tell the story, but they weren't inside me anymore. Mm. I don't know if that answers the question or not. But Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Um, we have received uh, quite a few questions. So let's see uh, whether we could uh, respond to all of them in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> a lightning round. <laughs> Um, the first two questions echo each other. So perhaps I will read one, the two of them together and you could um, choose to respond to them separately or together. This one comes from Roxy. Do you find that the poetry of memory, especially poetry memorializing political crises, is especially helpful now? Like many, I read you in the early 80s. By the late 80s, I was in the Cornell MFA program, and it felt like political poetry was being torn down. It feels relevant again. Why? I, and, I, okay, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just say that I think that Amy's question echoes it. So perhaps let me read it too. Okay, uh, Amy writes, you touched on this in your last poem, but you've often addressed urgent political and humanitarian issues in your work. Would you say that there are any unique limitations or advantages to writing as means of documenting these events? Um, I, I think the one thing to understand about documenting events is if you're a journalist, your job is to convey information. Um, but if you're a poet or a literary writer, it's not information you're after. It's something deeper, and it's something that can reach the human soul, can reach people in a, um, and and allow them to imaginatively experience what you are speaking of, what you're writing of. And as far as what whether it is um, necessary and urgent now, I would say. Perhaps, but I do know that it's possible now. And as the questioner uh, conveys during her time at Cornell years ago, it was frowned upon to, re to write uh, in mm -hmm. the United States about events that might be construed in some way as political. And um, so it was a violation of some um, unspoken rule to publish uh, poems that... Um, they were not about personal life and 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 the and interiority. So uh, so now it's possible, and now it, we are living in a ma in a time of great urgency, and have been for a long time. But it's now being recognized, and so I'm hoping that because poetry does what it wants to do, I'm hoping that that poets will feel and internalize this urgency within themselves deeply enough that the, that poetry will visit them, you know, uh, and that these events will, will be voiced in poems now and in the future, in the years to come. At least it's not being condemned anymore. And for me, that's, I take great heart in that. 
Thank you. So do I. <laughs> um, uh, there's a question from Sage. Um, uh, perhaps it will be the last question we'll take today. Um, I'm just in awe at the haunting composition, in awe at the haunting composition of the brutal images in incredibly poetic language. What does this process of writing about trauma look like for you? How do you land on the right words for what you want to convey? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, the short answer is I, I place myself in a certain state and I, of remembrance and, um, and something comes. I work the language. I care deeply about the music, the cadences, the internal music. And I, so I do, um, I do work the language that way. But I feel only great um, gratitude when it when it comes when it comes together that way. I don't really know how to say how it's done because there's no real method, you know, to to writing poetry. One has to hover before the page in meditative expectancy and wait and hope that hope that the language comes through us. Because, of course, the language was not made by us. We inherited it. And we inherited all that has been done with it from other poets and writers. And um, so we, we, we take the pen to the page and we bring everything we have and we hope for the best, mm -hmm. I think. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carolyn. The, uh, the invisible gods of um, Zoom time <laughs> are alerting us to the fact that it is time to read a final poem for us and to conclude the event. Somebody also asked what happened to your Salvadoran friend, where is he now? And um, very quickly, get the books. I'm going to tell you where to get them and you'll know the answer to those questions. Yeah. Thank you, Valjina. Thank you so much. This is a poem that came to me when I was in chemotherapy, and uh, it begins with a line from a French resistance poet. What comes? I brought from despair a basket so light, my love, that it could have been woven of willows. René Chal. To speak is not yet to have spoken the not yet of a white realm of nothing left, neither for itself nor another, a no longer already there, along with the arrival of what has been light and the reverse of light, terror as walking blind along the breaking sea, body in whom I lived, the not yet of death darkening what it briefly illuminates, an unknown place, as between languages, back and forth, breath to breath, as a calm in the surround rises, fireflies in lindens, an ache of pine. You have yourself within you. Yourself, you have her. And there is nothing that cannot be seen. Open then to the coming of what comes. Thank you. My friends, they say that we cannot buy friendship or love, but it's not true because we can buy books. And books are our friends and our lovers, our companions. I would like to urge you to get Carolyn's books at Politics and Prose Bookstore in Washington, D.C., an amazing bookstore, and at our own Ithaca's Buffalo Street Books, a bookstore I love dearly. Um, and um, I would like to thank Carolyn Fouché again, the amazing, the legendary Carolyn Fouché. Thank you so much for the generous, amazing the Lasnik family. Thank you to our outstanding E. Cornell for producing our events. They are unmatched uh, among all other uh, E events around this year. And thank you for all of you for attending. We hope to see you again in the fall. Bye. Bye.